Well, on behalf of the European Foundation for Democracy, I would like to welcome you all to this webinar co-organizing cooperation with the US mission to the EU and European Values Center for Security Policy based in Prague. Uh, this program is under EFT's disinformation program. Uh, Russia and China are screen, uh, increasingly seen as threats by the West. And today we will discuss in what ways uh, these two countries and their goals are different and similar. Both the EU and the United States have also been complaining about the propaganda and disinformation efforts of these two countries during the COVID-19 crisis. Our speakers will also explore this issue and the dynamics behind it. Uh, three excellent speakers are joining us today. Uh, Todd Helmus from Rand Corporation, Jakob Janda from European Value Center, and Balkan Devland from University of Copenhagen and McDonald Laurier Institute. Our speakers will open the session with their analysis up to eight minutes, and then we will follow with the Q&A. You can type and send your questions and comments by using the Q&A box on your screen during and after these presentations. And following the presentations, I will go through them and direct, it to, direct them to the speakers. So uh, we will start with Jakub, who will be focusing on China and then we'll continue with, uh, with Russia and Balkan. And then Todd will have a very specific uh, presentation about the social media strategy of Russia. Jakub, thank, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Murat. And thank you very much to EFD for doing this together with us. We are very happy and it's, it's good to talk about these issues. So um, I will talk about the uh, Chinese interference or malign influence in Europe. And when I say China, I mean mainly the, the, I mean only the government. So meaning the CCP, Chinese Communist Party. That's what I mean by China, unfortunately, in this case. Um, I think the, the most important thing here is that we see that uh, China is essentially becoming more of what Russia does in Europe. The tactics are getting similar, even though the long-term strategies might be quite different because of the size and um, long-term strategies of the Russian and Chinese regime. Uh, more practically, I would say that if you talk to almost anybody in European political establishments two years ago, people would probably tell you that Russia is a major aggressive threat, but it's more like a regional power, which is, which is actually more like a short-term threat. While if you talk about China, uh, China is not a hostile power to Europe, um, and that uh, China actually is um, trying to play the positive note, trying to uh, pretend to be constructive and with, there are many things Europeans should engage on with the Chinese government. That's something what I think most, prob most people would tell you two years ago. But today I think it's quite clear, not only because of this pandemic, but more or less because of the internal structures and decisions of the Chinese government, we could clearly say that, they are get, that China is uh, much more hostile against European liberal democracies and, uh, than it was a year ago. And um, I think if we are talking directly about the objectives of the, of the Chinese government in Europe and comparing it to what the Kremlin, what the Russian government wants, I would argue that uh, their main strategic objective in Europe is basically the same. And that is to decouple Europe from the United States. There are many, I would say, um, natural factors on ongoing between, between Europe and the United States. For example, the way how President Trump views the transatlantic relations as well. That's something what obviously hurts the alliance between Europe and the US. Uh, but I think this is clearly what the Russia try tries to do and China does today as well in many aspects, is trying to make it much harder for Europe and the United States to actually work together on these security and also economic issues as well. So the main objective of China in Europe, I would say, is to decouple Europe from the United States and essentially use Europe as a, as a platform, as a market, obviously, but also as a political platform and essentially neutralize uh, Europe as a geopolitical actor which will be standing up to Chinese interference strategies across the globe, for example, in Africa. That's clearly what Beijing wants. Uh, so that's the objective in a more, more strategic terms. But if you go below the strategic level, I would say that there are at least four main objectives, uh, you could say operational ones, uh, which the Chinese government tries to do uh, or um, organize currently in Europe. And it's a long-term thing, and, but there are changes which are ongoing because of the pandemic. So four objectives of the Chinese government currently happening in Europe in the ways how Chinese government interferes in Europe. 
um, number one or one of the one of the first ones is uh, basically to pressure put pressure against Taiwan. So essentially, we see the Chinese government blackmailing European governments, telling them you better shut up on Taiwan, you better not to mention Taiwan, you don't, you shouldn't be cooperating with Taiwan, uh, otherwise we will punish you. That is what the Chinese government does today. Uh, the second objective which we could see is clearly. Uh, that the Chinese government tries to pressure, and I would say blackmail, various European governments into allowing and using Huawei as, um, as one of the core pillars of the future 5G networks. We see it in, I mean, from the UK, in Germany, we could see, could see it in Central Eastern Europe, where the Chinese diplomats, Chinese government, is essentially telling the local governments, you must use Huawei, or, you sh you, uh, or the, in, in other words, you cannot use any security arguments against Huawei, otherwise we will punish you economically. That is what the Chinese government does today. Uh, the third objective, which is long term as well, is that the Chinese government tries to silence uh, European liberal democracies, on its human rights abuses. And it's not only the concentration camps for Uyghurs, it's also anything else, for example, currently what is happening in Hong Kong where China is, uh, the Chinese government is essentially taking over Hong Kong and um, it's actually killing anything that it promised to do in 1997. Uh, and it cannot be trusted basically because it also co uh, violates its own com commitments. Um, so that's the third, ob third objective of Beijing. But the fourth one, which is currently quite contemporary, is um, they are, I would say that the Chinese government essentially does a very similar thing currently in Europe, which the Russian government did in summer of 2014. If you remember, that was the MA-17, which the Russian armed forces shut down uh, an airliner, killed almost 300 uh, civilians. But what happened after that was the, was the new game. And that was massive disinformation campaigns uh, organized by the Russian entities, by Russian institutions, which uh, developed many conflicting disinformation narratives, uh, tr which try to deflect the blame from Russia for shutting down MA17. And that, that is exactly what the Chinese government does today on a much larger and global scale because of the pandemic. So in, in the current pandemic, there are two, two objectives um, which, which the Chinese government tries to accomplish in Europe. One, deflect the blame. So basically say, well, we, are, we as the Chinese government, we are not responsible. We didn't do anything wrong. We didn't lie. We didn't manipulate. That's what they are trying to do. And the second one is to um, push the image that China is a savior, meaning the Chinese government is the one which should be trusted by European, European governments or states. Uh, China is the one which is coming over to the rescue of Europe in the current pandemic. And by the way, Europeans shouldn't trust the Americans. That's what the Chinese diplomats and Chinese institutions are saying in Europe. Um, so that's, that's where I would say that there, there are not only the tactical, but by operational objectives, which are um, which, where China mimics what Russia has been doing in Europe since at, at least 2014, since Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, and just to finish up, I think there are two main tools we should be looking into, uh, which China uses quite well. And that is um, the elite capture, meaning um, China essentially purchasing political influence through political media or academic institutions and individuals, basically buying their trust, buying many of people, uh, people's minds in some, in some cases. So quite often you don't see the strategic disinformation from China uh, being done through social media in Europe. That's something what we see very much happening from the Russian government as well and local proxies. But the strategic disinformation of China in Europe is currently, um, I would say, organized and spread by various elite captured individuals. Those are former politicians of some European countries, former public officials, people who are essentially working on behalf of China in this case. And the, the, the last point I would make is that there is an important tool which China uses, and that is the perception of economic blackmail, meaning that um, if you, as a local government, national government, if, if uh, as a European entity, if you do something the Chinese government doesn't like, uh, the threat will come will will be that they will um, they might uh, blackmail you economically. And that's what we have seen, for example, from the Chinese ambassador in Berlin, essentially telling the German government, if you don't allow Huawei into your 5G networks, your your car, car industry in China they will suffer. And that's what we have seen in Prague, the Chinese government doing the same thing against Czech, Czech companies. If, for example, one of the Czech politicians travels to Taiwan, as it was planned. So those are the tools which are used by the Chinese government. Um, and I'll stop here to, for, for more time for discussion. 
Thank you, Jakub. So we move from China to Russia and we'll continue with the Balkan. Thanks a lot, Murat, and thanks for having me. Um, and thanks uh, to the European Foundation for Democracy uh, for um, uh, for organizing this, this webinar. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here with, with these great experts. Um, I, my comments are going to be brief as well so that we have some time for, for Q&A. What I want to do is sort of talk in three, three parts. Uh, one, generally, what sort of what is the modus of operandi um, for the uh, for the Russian uh, political warfare, without necessarily going too much into the specifics of the um, uh, information component, uh, partly on social media, because uh, Todd, Todd will be talking about that. The second is why they are doing it, what's the purpose, and and lastly, sort of wrap it up with, uh, is there anything specific, or what can we tell about during the COVID nineteen uh, crisis and how how, how Kremlin. Is, 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 is utilizing the existing crisis to advance its, its political aims. Um, when I look at it, how the you know, general you know, Russian uh, political warfare works, and not only, so this is not only limited to disinformation campaigns about things like political assassinations, corruption, um, um, et cetera, you know, support for, uh, for extreme uh, political uh, moments throughout Europe and, and, and whatnot. Um, what, uh, what I see is, is what I call a sort of a lean startup model um, of, of political warfare in the sense that it's a scattershot of, of a variety of, of, of methods to see uh, what sticks and then move on. So you know, fail fast, fail often, uh, but identify multiple things uh, that could work given the context. So it is more contextualized depending on, on, on the target, depending on the target society, um, depending on the country, which, um, uh, what, what, kind of, what kind of methodologies might could work. It could be blackmail in a, in a certain um, setting. It could be spread of uh, disinformation and hoaxes in another one. Um, it could be corruption in 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 in, in, a, in a given other other setting. Um, and one of the reasons uh, for this is uh, that the um, the political warfare is not so much micromanaged um, uh, on 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 the Kremlin side in the sense that uh, Putin uh, and his sort of uh, close, close circle. Set out the basic strategic uh, parameters and and the goals that that they want to achieve, and then let uh, you know various uh, actors and various factions uh, within uh, within the Russian ruling elite to try to to um, to find ways to please Kremlin, uh, and that enables them to create a sort of an open market within the uh, w within within the Kremlin circle. Uh, to pick and select what kind of methods do work and, and, and reward and, and move on from there. So there's not so much of a micromanagement about specific policy actions, unless they're very high, um, high level um, uh, actions, uh, but providing general strategic guidelines um, to, to, to give for, for the, for the uh, subordinates to go and, and figure out ways in which um, they can serve uh, the strategic interests of Kremlin. Now, what is that? What is that particular uh, interest? Um, we keep talking about uh, you know, the Kremlin's purpose of, of trying to undermine the West and subvert the Western-led international order. Um, uh, but the, why Kremlin tries to do that? And I think one can focus on three sort of um, drivers in which why Putin wants to um, Undermine and uh, undermine the West, you know, so chaos and and disorder within our societies, uh, and 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 subvert the the international order. One um, is is regime protection. In the sense that um, the existence of, of a liberal democratic alternative uh, in the West and in 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 countries that are bordering Russia is a is a constant reminder uh, uh, for Putin's regime. Uh, and for Russian people, uh, that this is not the only alternative. There is a better alternative there. Making the alternative, the liberal democracies, look bad uh, and you know ineffective and and non-functioning um, uh, would go a lot to serve as 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 regime um, uh, you know regime protection, regime survival purposes uh, for Russia. That's, so that's number one. Number two is. Um, uh, Kremlin is, is quite aware that they do have a limited window of opportunity to claim um, a, a place in the table for great powers. Um, that for the long term, for economic and, and population reasons and, and others, um, uh, Russian 
power is declining compared to, 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 to other, other actors, particularly China. Um, so they have a limited window of opportunity to be able to shape the international order to ensure that they will um, be one of the key players that shape the, uh, the upcoming um, uh, world order. So uh, undermining, you know, creating a, a distraction um, and, 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 and confusion uh, within, uh, within the West uh, serves um, that purpose to, to, to sort of uh, enable Russia to play an outsized role compared to its capabilities. Um, and, and lastly, it also serves as, as a way in which uh, a Kremlin can extend its control um, over it is supposed or self-declared um, sphere of influence. If, if the West, if the liberal democracies are, are busy dealing with their domestic issues, are not united, are, are concerned about domestic stability, uh, they are less likely to push back uh, when Kremlin um, you know, extend its, its, uh, its influence, extend its meddling, uh, when it, in, it, in its what they call the, the new abroad. So those three purposes together um, is, is the primary sort of mechanism in which I think the primary reasons in which uh, the, uh, Putin's regime um, tries to undermine, um, undermine the West um, so that there is no more pushback. So there is no, um, you know, so the West is too busy dealing with its domestic issues and problems uh, that they are not paying attention to, to what, what Russia is, is doing around. Um, and lastly, you know, how sort of it differs within, within, um, uh, within the current COVID crisis. Uh, from what I can see, I think the, the primary sort of difference co compared to particularly the Chinese disinformation campaigns um, is that while China tries to sort of shape the narrative as, as, as Jakub uh, pointed out and sort of deflect the blame uh, with a bunch of different uh, mechanisms, including you know, creating hoaxes. Uh, the Russian strategy, um, to me, looks like more using this as another theme to undermine the, uh, the trust within the Western societies towards its, its institutions. Um, that does include deliberate spread of, of misinformation and disinformation, including like, you know, washing work and, and whatnot and, and, and specific things. And I would expect um, similar, uh, you know, disinformation campaigns and, and, and uh, particularly hoaxes uh, would be ramped up as we move towards developing a vaccine. I wouldn't be surprised to see a, a lot of push um, for, uh, for sort of anti-vax uh, positions uh, from Russian, uh, Russian bots and trolls, which they were, we know that at least within the US uh, context, that they were really pushing that um, uh, for a while, a lot of the anti-vax um, uh, movement. So uh, I would expect that to be pushed as well. Again, the, the purpose is to ensure that the, the, the West um, is, is too busy is sorting its own house so that they do not have time to turn their eyes on, um, on, uh, on, on Kremlin's doings around, around the world. Uh, I'll stop here. Um. Thank you, Balkan. Now we will continue with Todd. We keep talking about actually uh, Russian propaganda, disinformation in the West and how they have been using actually social media. But what are the dynamics behind this? What is the strategy? How they use social media and does it really work? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me um, in Balkan. That was great to hear your comments uh, about, um, about the overall Russian strategy. So I'll try not to focus too much on that end. Um, what I will talk about is uh, briefly um, uh, a broad overview of, uh, of, of, the, of the Russian approach um, and tools, and then talk a little bit more specifically about campaigns and, and sort of the how-to they've done this, starting with the US campaign and like the election for 2016 um, which is ongoing, I think, and then um, moving our way to Europe and then uh, finish up on the COVID side. So, um, <clears throat> you know, Russia is actually quite prolific uh, on this. A um, couple of Princeton researchers, Jacob Shapiro and uh, Diego Martin, sort of tabulated, uh, you know, they identified upwards of 50, over 50 uh, propaganda campaigns, and they realized, and about 38 of those camps, so Russia has launched like 38 separate online social media propaganda campaigns in the last five years, which is actually, I think, impressive. Um, 
And these campaigns have just a diverse array of goals attached to them, which in some ways makes di discerning their strategy a bit confusing, though uh, Balkan, I think you did a great job on that. You know, they're trying to discredit opposed political, political leadership like Aman, Emmanuel uh, Macron and Hillary Clinton, trying to polarize American society, which was a key goal of their election campaign, supporting Brexit, supporting alt-right groups in the US and Europe, attacking Ukraine, um, to then to very issue-specific items that they're, that they're trying to promote. So they're very active and prolific. They have a lot of organs, uh, state organs that help facilitate this. Uh, sort of close to the Russian vest, of course, you have Russian institutions, such as the intelligence agencies and Sputnik, which I think Sputnik is a huge force multiplier for them. Um, uh, a little bit further away, you get RT, which is not Russian to own per se, but certainly supported. Um, and then you have, you know, the, the role the oligarchs play with the IRA and other institutions like that. And then you have all these proxies that are out there. Um, I don't know, it's called, some call them, I've called them useful idiots at times. People that are not affiliated with the Russian state, but they're putting out a lot of Russian content. And so when you look at the social media channels, you see a lot of stuff and you, it's hard to tell, is this Russian state or is this just somebody who just loves Russia? Um, uh, or they just love the goal that Russia is trying to promote at that moment. So there's a lot of organs attached to this. Um, I think what they did in the, uh, you, um, you know, if you, if you look at a very specific campaign, like their efforts for the uh, uh, the poisoning of the Russian spy, Sergei Skripal, um, you know, they had press statements, Russian bots, trolls, um, just sort of a blizzard of falsehoods put out by an array of different media channels to help muddy the waters. Um, and I think that was a great example of the coordinated campaign of just putting out just random stuff um, to a strategic purpose for them. Uh, in the U.S. election, um, you know, they did a lot. <laughs> I'm actually quite impressed what they did for the U.S. election. I think the U.S. would have struggled to, to launch a campaign like that. You know, they put together like over 10 million tweets, a thousand YouTube videos, um, 100,000 Instagram posts, 60,000 Facebook posts, um, and content that was like really nicely targeted at very specific audiences. Um, and I think they had a good sense of, of who their audience was, putting out anti harsh anti-immigrant content to conservatives. They were putting out content on uh, pro-confederacy, anti-immigration, gun rights, Christian, uh, you know, sort of extreme Christian content, Blue Lives Matter on the left side, LG, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual uh, audiences, Bernie Sanders, African-Americans. You know, and I think a lot of this content was designed to build audiences to, to an end we probably don't even know. Um, you know, they, a lot of their ads were focused on building uh, audiences for Facebook groups or very issue specific items like I just mentioned. And, you know, once you like these groups, you are now an audience that's going to continue to receive content. And you know, people talk about like, well, you know, was that effective? Well, I don't know if that was effective. There's some data that suggests that they were putting out content targeting audiences that already believed in the content they were disseminating. But who knows what their long-term strategy was for trying to take advantage of those audiences that they would now have easy access to. Um, and I really see what their efforts are trying to do is, of course, promote disunity uh, within the American political system, but then also, I think, just radicalize um, audiences. And um, you just create this really sort of fragmented society if everyone is just sort of extreme on every end. And you know, I don't think they were effective on that, but that's certainly what they tried to do. Um, then you have on the European side, I think again, you see this theme of disunity that they were trying to promote. Um, they certainly want Eastern Europe to not align with Western Europe. They certainly want countries to uh, either not align with NATO or uh, be suspicious of NATO. Um, you know, in STRATCOM, COE did a nice report on Sputnik in Serbia. Uh, you know, and Sputnik's putting out content that's saying, you know, the EU is hegemonic and weak, NATO is weak, they're not united, it's aggressive. Um, trying to note that countries like Montenegro, Albania, and North Macedonia are Western puppets, while Serbia is holding strong with its uh, Soviet leanings, with its Russian leanings, pardon me. Um, and even we sort of discovered content in our analysis of Twitter in Ukraine, we, we identified like 40,000 um, vociferously pro um, accounts uh, targeting Ukraine with content trying to undermine Ukrainian democracy, its support, its alliance with the West. Um, and then, you know, but this, this other side, there's this war of words happening with 
another 40,000 accounts countering Russia, attacking Russian history, attacking, outing Russian accounts, promoting a free European society. So there's this really uh, strong war of words, I think, happening in these societies. Um, but again, this common theme of Russian trying to promote disunity and cleavages where it can promote cleavages. And the fact that they are targeting cleavages that already exist suggests that it's a good strategy for them because these cleavages exist and promoting, pushing out content that has an audience that's already somewhat receptive to it, uh, I think is probably a good, good move for Russia. Bad for us, but probably a good move for Russia. Um, finally, let's talk about COVID-19. Um, you know, I don't know. Their objectives for COVID-19, I've, I've sort of heard it various, they want to protect their image. Russia is obviously struggling um, within Russia, so trying to uh, distract from that is helpful for them. Uh, questioning the international response, undermining Europe, all that is in play for Russia. I, I just see this as a continuation of this um, fragmentation campaign that they're on. Um, you know, a lot of the content, I've not seen it being a heavy social media campaign. At least I've not seen Facebook and Twitter. Normally, Facebook and Twitter just like out these campaigns as soon as they see them, if we're talking like bots and trolls. But we are seeing uh, publications like Sputnik, um, Southfront, RT, push out a lot of content um, that my colleague Chris Paul would sort of easily call a firehood of falsehoods. Um, you know, uh, sowing confusion about treatment. Washing hands are not effective. Zinc is a good treatment. Try Why not try hydrochloroquine as a treatment? Um, downplaying vaccines, uh, traditional medicines better than vaccines, forced vaccinations, the government's going to do forced vaccinations and do mind control techniques um, and uh, have control of the population, which to us sounds silly, but you know, there are a lot of anti-vaxxers out there that worry about that and they are hitting that target very nicely, I think. Um, and then, of course, downplaying the pandemic. The, it's a hoax, it's mortal, the mortality is exaggerated, it's a power grab invented by media. Um, I don't know, it, it's a funny approach that they have to this because they just, they do throw a lot to the wall. And some of those themes are not gonna stick, um, but others will. And I think they probably do a good job of identifying content that's effective, promoting that, and then turning off the content that, that isn't effective. Which I think is a good media strategy. So I'll, uh, I'll pause there. Well, thank you very much, Toad. Um, so I'll, I'll be combining a few questions actually, uh, because they're coming in the same line. Um, because when the West is criticizing Russia and China, basically, uh, Russia and China turning back and say that, okay, you complain about propaganda and disinformation, uh, but actually you do the same thing. And for example, Europe is, okay, financing NGOs, work on Russia and China, there's Euronews, etc. So, and then they claim that it is basically the same thing. Um, do you think they have a point? Or if it's not the case, in what ways this is really different than what China and Russia has been, have been doing? Balkan? Um, I think the, well, first, I, th I don't think it's the same. One of the reasons is that I think there is a very clear asymmetrical uh, threat perception. Uh, asymmetrical threat perception in the sense that for authoritarian regimes, the existing of a liberal democratic regime would always continue to be uh, a threat for, do, for their domestic uh, regime structure. Um, one of the sort of clear <laughs> examples of that uh, is, is that, you know, unless you are a sort of intelligence asset, nobody goes and, and claims um, asylum in Russia or China. Um, one of the uh, sort of primary uh, reasons for that is that the, 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 one of the primary concerns is, is, is that people don't want to live under repressive uh, regimes. And the existing of a functioning, open, liberal democratic system out there um, would always uh, pose an existential threat to the ruling ideology, ruling um, uh, worldview of, of those, of those um, states. Um, so the very existence is a threat. Um, however, vice versa is not necessarily the case in the sense that unless authoritarian regimes um, aggressively and intentionally try to engage in undermining um, the, 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 the Western liberal uh, democratic um, systems, um, the, 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 the liberal democracies, given its multiplicity, given its, its, its plurality, given its diversity, are not necessarily keen on going and 
uh, arguing for a uh, regime change in those places. Most uh, liberal Democrats would, uh, would go and highlight that it is uh, up to the people living in those countries um, to, to change the regime, but they will uh, uh, provide examples uh, of a successful um, uh, liberal, liberal democratic system out there. So I think the, the threat perception is, is clearly uh, asymmetrical. Um, and therefore, the, uh, the way in which uh, these, uh, these, these regimes claim that what exactly is doing, uh, you know, what we are doing is exactly the same, but what liberal democracies are doing is not. You don't have, you know, ex, you know with the exception of extreme fringe uh, elements within Western societies, you don't have people pining for, for a CCP like regime or Putin like regime in the West. Um, so the, their purpose is not, you know, so you don't have natural constituencies in the West. They don't have it. But there's clearly, you know, natural constituencies among the people who want to be free and live in a democratic liberal system in those countries, in Russia and China. And thus, of course, the regime perceives it as a, as a, as a continuing threat. Jakob, would you like to add something? I fully agree. I would just add that uh, not only is there a moral difference, which Balkan just mentioned, uh, or the values-based one, but there is also a very practical difference between what the West does and what, uh, what, uh, what Russia and China and other dictatorships try to do against liberal democracies. Uh, first, they call us, meaning liberal democratic regimes, their threats. If you read their strategy documents, uh, or if you listen to the speeches of the leaders of basically Russian and Chinese state, uh, you'll hear that they, they consider us to be their, their, their threats as well. And not only us as, as governments or states, but, all, but the liberal democratic regimes, uh, because they are essentially afraid of them, as Balkan mentioned. For, for clearly, that's one of the reasons why Russia invaded Ukraine as well, for example. And uh, in, in very practical sense, uh, if you look just into the inf inf information domain, uh, I think there is a clear difference between what the West does. Uh, I think it's clearly, um, I mean, completely legitimate uh, when the West uh, pu uh, publishes or supports, for example, um, uh, Russian language media. Uh, for example, like uh, Radio Free Europe, which is sitting in Prague, or many others, which are doing similar job across the globe. Um, and it's open, it's, it's, um, it's publicly known and transparent who is funding it, which specific people are doing it, and that's how it should be in free societies. While what we, we could see Russia doing, and um, slowly China tries to do it as well, is when they try to actually buy in or, or develop a clandestine influence, which is non-transparent. So essentially, if you ask those who are spreading this information in many countries in Europe, uh, for example, on behalf of the Russian foreign policy interests, quite often you will find local proxies who are not transparent over their connections to Russia. And that's one of the things which I think we, it's our job as researchers in general to make it transparent because we are, uh, I would say, fans of a free public and debate. And the, the way how we could be, how we could work here is to make it make it transparent, public, and let's discuss how it works. And we could there is so much evidence that, for example, Russia funds uh, European extremists and paramilitary groups. Many of them are actually in the in the Russian pocket or the Russian government's pocket. Um, and we have seen also, and there is direct evidence of, Russian, of the Russian state conducting terrorism inside of Europe, uh, be it the Salisbury attack, be it the, the, the assassination in, in daylight Berlin last, last summer, uh, be it the um, uh, Russian actions in Ukraine, for example. There are many other aspects, and that's clearly what the West doesn't do against them. So, I mean, there are, clear, there are many differences, and I will stop here so we have enough time for other questions. Sure. Todd, would you like to add something? Um, so the that, next, no, those were good oh, answers to sorry. me. Um, so next question is from James Wilson. Uh, how should the EU foreign ministers react when they meet tomorrow in the light of today's adoption by China of a draft security law for Hong Kong? So I guess we'll start with Jakub. Uh -huh. Well, I think the EU, meaning EU foreign ministers or the EIS as well, should actually stand up for our values. And uh, to be very specific, I think the f one, one, uh, one thing they should all do is they should publicly say, if there is somebody who is threatened by the Chinese, Chinese totalitarian state in, for example, Hong Kong, 
those are the people who are welcome in Europe and we are happy to grant them political asylums because if somebody is under oppression because of their political speech, which is guaranteed by the UN Charter, for example, those are the people we are going to protect. And that's exactly if the EU says about it itself, we are a human rights superpower, that's exactly how we should act. I don't expect our foreign ministers to do it, unfortunately, because they are too scared to upset the Chinese regime because of the economic blackmail, but that's principally what they should do. But that's the principal approach, let's say. There are many others which are more, more practical. I would really say that the Chinese government's takeover over Hong Kong is very similar to what we have seen Russia doing, we could say, for example, 2008 in Georgia. I mean, after that, the West didn't really pay attention. Everybody said, well, it's fine. It's basically some, some small country somewhere down in the east, I mean, Georgia. So maybe Russia will just take, take, take part of Georgia. Everything will be fine. And after that came the Obama, Obama's uh, administration the reset effort, which completely failed. I think, I mean, me coming, sitting in Prague and coming from a, from a country which saw what appeasement works in 1938 Munich Agreement, clearly we know that there is no way how appeasement works towards aggressors. So if we see the Chinese government taking over and uh, Hong Kong and basically uh, killing its um, international commitments, which it did com com uh, concretely on Hong Kong, uh, we can't trust the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, because of, of what they do. So I think that's the way how we should behave. How can we trust the CCP, the Ch Chinese Communist Party? They are breaking their own commitments. How can we entrust them with our critical information infrastructure? I mean, who are they into 5G, for example? How, we, how can we trust in, in there? So I'm not saying we should be killing trade with China, not at all. I'm just trying to say we cannot trust the Chinese government, and that's how we should react. And uh, more practically, just to finish up, I think basically essentially uh, European foreign or EU foreign ministers should, should start doing two things. One, um, start drafting internal processes which will lead to, um, let's say, smart decoupling. Uh, doesn't mean killing trade with China, but meaning looking over how and where are we dependent on China, how can the Chinese government use the leverage against us, and getting rid of that leverage. That's something that won't happen tomorrow. It will, have to take, it will take time and it will be costly but we need to do it. And second, you uh, foreign ministers should launch something what we have seen uh, the, um, the Eisenhower administration do in the 50s, which was called the Solarian Project, which, I mean, much, much of it is already declassified. Essentially what happened was that the, the US administration during the 50s, early 50s, so that the new, obviously, basically the new Cold War is coming up, essentially a, con a systematic confrontation, a systemic confrontation between free world and the communist world in the time and they set up a program where they evaluated how can we, they effectively defeat the totalitarian regime on the other side meaning the soviet union during that time it took several years it was very detailed and this is exactly what europe doesn't have most of european countries don't have this and we should start thinking about this because i'm afraid we are at the beginning of a systematic uh, or sorry systemic uh, rivalry which will not go away because the Chinese communists don't want this to go away. Uh, so we need to get, get prepared. This will not uh, take over just a couple of months and it will be over. It will not, I'm afraid. Yes, welcome. I just wanted to add one thing with, you know, that, to the excellent analysis that Jakob did, and that is uh, one way to deal with, with the situation in Hong Kong is, is, is one of my colleagues in, in McDonald Laurier Institute, Marcus Kolga, has been um, uh, arguing for the use of Magnitsky uh, legislation in different, different countries to target specific Chinese um, uh, policymakers and, and those who are responsible for the oppression um, in, in Hong Kong and elsewhere, um, uh, personally, in the, and their assets and, and uh, et cetera, through those legislation and, I and impose sanctions on them. Uh, and I think that is a very important way, not only a symbolic way, but also quite a, you know, a practical way of, of showing solidarity to the people, people in Hong Kong. Uh, if we target um, those um, CCP uh, uh, officers and officials who are, uh, you know, uh, stashing their um, uh, corruptly gained wealth in our countries and enjoying uh, the, the freedoms uh, when they travel around and, and, and have property and, and so on so forth in our places while they're cracking down uh, on the democratic aspirations uh, of, of Hong Kongers. Todd, would you like to add something? Otherwise, I go ahead with the next question. Uh, next question, I will combine again two different questions, actually. Uh, one from Gary Cartwright from EU Today. 
So he says, against this background of Russian state-backed media showing this information, we will still find Russian so-called journalists in, for example, European Parliament committee meetings. Is it viable for us to continue in this spirit of openness? And I will combine this with another question, uh, talking about the liberal democracies, because obviously things are very different in authoritarian regimes. So within our liberal democracies, and by still respecting our own liberal systems and democratic values, how can we really uh, tackle with this, this threat and disinformation propaganda efforts? Uh, I think Todd is frozen, so Jakub Balkan, would you like to go ahead, one of you? Jakub? Okay, I'll start. Um... I think we, I mean, obviously as, as Democrats with a small D or people who believe in democracy, we shouldn't be censoring those who are, um, who are journalists. Uh, and that's exactly why we should protect journalism. And uh, there are, those are only symbolic moves. But what I believe should be done is that, for example, in the EU institutions, uh, you, uh, people or in media who should be allowed to, to get in and get the privilege of being journalists, getting the easy access to institutions or politicians, should be those who actually are, um, are journalists. And in many cases, those who serve on Russian state media, like Sputnik, RT, Zvezda, First Channel, there are many others, who essentially serve, and there's enough evidence for this, who do serve as, um, as uh, communicators of the Russian government not really as, as independent journalists, though they should not be uh, considered to be journalists. And I mean, they are free to travel across Brussels, for example, if they get the visa, but they shouldn't be given the privilege which journalists get. Uh, they shouldn't be given the protection which journalists get. Um, so, and that's the, that's the way how we as, um, let's say, people who believe in liberal democracy and our institutions should, base, should protect those real journalists. Who actually are who are having quite tough times in many cases and countries, but this um, we should basically protect them from those who are predators in this area, who are pretending to be journalists but who are not. And those are in many cases the Russian state-owned media and state-controlled media. Uh, but while there is a big difference between those who serve in Russian independent media who are struggling and under high pressure, there we should differentiate. But for example, if you look to the United States, you could see that uh, the, the, some of the Chinese, Chinese state owned media were forced by the US, US Department of Justice to register under the FARA uh, Act, uh, meaning they, they were essentially uh, told that they are considered by the US government, that they are, um, they are the entities or they are lobbying on behalf of the Chinese government. And this is how they should be treated. Uh, they are free to travel across the DC, for example, but they cannot be considered to be journalists. They are, they are lo essentially lobbying on behalf of their own government, which is something what journalists shouldn't do. So, I mean, I, should, I think we should just use those rules. Or, for example, last point I would make, we should look into what Australia does and their transparency scheme, which is quite similar, but maybe a bit tougher than the US uh, Foreign Agent in, uh, Registration Act. That's something what, what we should have in, in Europe. So for example, I'm amazed that still the European Commission is unwilling to put together a real um, a registry for, um, for lobbyists in Brussels, which would be enforceable and would actually really show who is lobbying who in Brussels for what money, just to make it transparent. And that's what we are not doing even in Brussels, which is amazing to me. Um. Todd, welcome back. I don't know if you could follow the questions. I will just maybe summarize uh, for you in case you have some comments as well. Uh, so there's an issue about also this uh, journalists who have been working for this uh, disinformation uh, channels uh, coming from Russia and China, and they can still operate as journalists in Brussels. So the question was that, should we really allow them to do uh, what they do? Or how do we deal with this issue within the limits of our liberal societies by still respecting uh, our own values and uh, freedom of speech? So if you would like to add something about this, you should unmute yourself, please. Thanks. I saw the comment, some of the questions in the comments bar, um, and I'll, I'll just hold, sort of hold fire for a couple of the next ones. I think, I think that question was um, very nicely responded to. Balkan, anything to add? I'll just very briefly add that uh, one way 
to you know what what, what Jakub said is is also uh, the, the the importance of precisely the foreign um, uh, agent registration acts um, and to show our societies uh, you know who is working for whom and I think that is you know it's a very fine line to walk you know to to, to walk um, but it is very important to so lay bare um, uh, the the sources of of these. Um, uh, well, where these things are coming from, and, and who are they sort of supporting and providing, uh, providing support? And and in, sort of, as, as 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 the as the saying goes, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Um, you know, shedding light on uh, on on the sources and the connections um, is, is sufficient. Uh, you know, at least you know, uh, it provides a sufficient balance between our security and and our, our freedoms um, to to ensure that, and it will be a very very good start. Um, I think the next question, Toad, you're in ideal position to, to respond. Uh, basically, the question is in what ways could disinformation campaigns coming from Russia and China affect the future elections in the United States? Um, uh, all right, yeah, I can, I can answer that one. I, I think they're, they're, a lot of their sort of disunity content is not, does not, does not change votes per se, but um, they do have a couple lines of con content that could be helpful for them. One, they have, they made an effort on voter suppression in the last election, um, trying to raise questions about rules of voting, places to vote, um, effectiveness of voting, um, using not voting as a means of protest against American society. I think that is uh, as potentially effective for them. Um, of course, they have content pushing candidates and that could be helpful for them. Um, but I think the que my question would be is how they sort of target that and can they target the undecideds? I don't know if they're good at targeting the undecideds yet. I think that takes a lot of knowledge. And of course, they would have to um, uh, target the battleground states. You know, it's not, campaigns in the U.S. are not run nationwide. They're run state to state to state. Um, and there's not a lot of use of putting a lot of effort at trying to convince Californians to, to, to vote for Trump because they're not going to vote for Trump. But um, uh, campaigns focused on Michigan, um, uh, Wisconsin, Florida, um, the, you know, I think th they need to look out for that type of thing. Maybe from the slightly different angle for Jakub and Balkan as well, like how also this sort of campaigns are effective in elections in European countries, uh, because we see that also many of these actors have been supporting far left, far right populist groups. Uh, are they really effective and what should we do to prevent that? I would argue that uh, one of the primary sort of impacts is not, you know, it, it would depend a lot on the specifics of the election, whether it would you know, have a sufficiently uh, you know, sizable impact to change the election results. Um, but, I'm, I'm, but I think the main, the main um, concern is not so much whether that would lead to one party winning versus the other, that's very hard to do uh, from an external uh, point of view just through social media campaigns. But uh, the, the problem is the, 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 the polarization that this leads during the election campaign, which then lingers on. And I think that is the primary uh, uh, threat here, that the continuing the increasing polarization within the society, which is sort of you know, expected during an election campaign. You're trying to convince the public to vote for you, so you sort of start to set yourself apart from the from the competition. But uh, the, the 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 Russian and Chinese sort of disinformation campaigns, uh, the, the the with the with those campaigns, the polarization is is becoming more and more sort of solidified, and thus carry over after the elections, and and leading to a more uh, a polarized political system, which leads to you know. Um, uh, deadlocks, which leads to inefficient uh, policymaking, which leads to all the things that we have been we have been talking about. So, my concerns about election campaigns is not so much whether the the, the, the whether the, those votes are, are are making people change their vote. Um, uh, my my concern is is the way they they sort of solidify that polarization, have the sort of this this uh, perverse um, uh, influence and impact on the political processes. On the, uh, on, the, on the notions of, of, of loyal opposition, on the notions of the rules of the game uh, and, 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 and the ways these, these, the political debate needs to be done. 
uh, but rather creating this whole us versus them and, and, a, and a completely sort of Manichaean uh, worldview within our societies. And that is my, my, my concern uh, with regards to the election campaigns. Yeah, would you like to add something? Because I know that in Czech Republic as well, it's, uh, it's an easy... Yep. Um, in the Czech Republic, we are also a good testing ground or laboratory of these issues, unfortunately. Um, just to add, uh, I mean, I won't talk about the information part of, of this influence, which Todd and Balkan mentioned, but uh, just don't forget that there's also the offline influence. Uh, and if you read over, for example, the archives of the KGB, the Mitro Hans archives, um, you could quite in detail see how the KGB actually tried to groom, or you could say try to create elite capture with specific individuals. And doesn't mean, uh, I mean, people probably always think it's just making somebody your own spy, somebody make, make somebody your intelligence asset. That's one of the options. The other option is, for example, grooming the ties between individuals, which essentially make them for Russian, for example, or to some extent for Chinese as well, even though it's much more complicated because Chinese, Chinese regime isn't very much liked among anybody, even in Europe. Their money is, but not really their regime. Well, the ideological component is there for some people regarding Russia. Um, and we could see in specific cases, for example, the case of the current Czech president, uh, or obviously many of people on the far right, far left, but for example, many people in German SPD, the Social Democratic Party as well, uh, but in many other parties across Europe, that those individuals quite often are groomed as, as, uh, as um, potential influence proxies, people who have various ties, sometimes they have their personal relations connected to those regimes or people who are, who are effectively represent them even without stating it sometimes. Um, but also there's, there is the easy elite capture where you see that people, for example, specific politicians across Europe are getting great offers of, well, if you do this today, when you are in power, maybe after you are done, you'll get a great uh, board membership. You'll get a great, get, get a great job from us, uh, be it a Russian or state or a proxy company. Those are not only people in Germany, those are many others, you know, many people connected, for example, uh, to the team of uh, the, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, David Cameron, for example. Many of them are, do work for the Chinese interest today, for example, name by name. Um, and just to finish up, it's not only our politicians, it's also our think tanks, for example. So the question is, for example, how many of uh, the major think tanks in, in Brussels who influence the policy debate actually are getting Chinese funding? And there are unfortunately quite many of them and people don't really care about it so much. And I think there's, it's the high time we start discussing it because we cannot let our own political, democratic policy discussions to be poisoned by uh, foreign interference, which is not disclosed. It needs to be publicly known and it needs to be publicly discussed. Um, so next question is from Rob Rester-Mutter. How can we avoid that so many drugs for medical use are yet only available from PRC? I think we have to be very alert to a Chinese monopoly in that field. Uh, we'll probably combine this with the fact that also during the, the COVID crisis, even when you ordered, for example, masks from a German company, and then you find out that they've been shipped from, uh, from China. So uh, I know that the EU has now plans to move production of some at least strategic uh, sectors to Europe. But do you think it's realistic and can we really do it in, in short term? Jakub? Okay, I'll start and I'll be quick this time. Uh, well, we must do it uh, because there, is, there isn't any other way. If we don't, we will not be sovereign countries. Uh, because if you are dependent in your critical infrastructure on a totalitarian government, you are really screwed. And that's essentially what we are in, at least many of us in Europe are currently. So we need to get rid of this, um, this dependence. Um, there was, there's a, a new uh, good report by Henry Jackson Society in London. They just published a report showing just to the five ice countries, so not, not just the UK from Europe, showing in which sectors and um, industry items are those democratic countries dependent on China. We need to do this on China and Russia, and obviously many other countries if there, is, there are others. And um, I think there is time for European countries to take to, if we are talking about national sovereignty, this is one of the things we need to do. Uh, and essentially, I mean, the, the easy thing to say and hard to do is that you want to be dependent only on allies and friends. Uh, you don't want to be dependent on those who think they are your enemies. 
And I mean, it's easy to say, but it's much harder to do. But I think Europe really needs to invest its resources. Now we could see it in the health sector, uh, but we should do it also in, in the energy sector, for example, where it's one of the main tools of elite capture and um, I would say economic blackmail as well, used by Russia against many of the European countries. And I'm afraid China will do the same in the digital area, or you could generally say in the economic area as well. Welcome, Todd. Welcome. Uh, very quickly, I, I, what I want to add uh, uh, is, is the fact that doing this, the sort of decoupling in the sense and, and, and you know, creating redundancies and reducing our, our dependence on these authoritarian regimes, um, should also garner uh, broad support. Uh, from the, the whole of the political spectrum, uh, because you know, it's, in that sense, it should be a relatively low-hanging fruit for political parties to coalesce around and push for it. Because either you are concerned about the national interest for the security reasons, or whether you are concerned about you know, labor practices and environmental standards, uh, whether uh, you are concerned about raising the living standards of uh, of, of the people within the low and medium uh, income uh, in your countries whether you are uh, interested in ensuring what is being produced and, and, and sold are done in, in, in an environmentally uh, you know, sort of friendly way and, 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 and the labor costs and, and the labor conditions are, are proper so and so forth. So there is a lot that this provides for whether you are concerned about traditional security or whether you are concerned about social and economic impact of, uh, of this across, across, the, uh, across the platform, across the uh, political spectrum, and should actually get a lot of support um, uh, from, our, uh, from our political parties across the board. Todd, would you like to add something? No, 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 thanks. Okay, I think next question will be a bit for you in any case. So the question is from David Toob. Uh, one of the features of the last few years' political discourse in the U.S. has been deployment of partisan conspiracy theories about Russian state interference. Those conspiracy theories have obscured and devalued the genuine examples of Russian social media campaigns that produces increased polarization and mistrust, a win-win situation for Russia. How can we safeguard against this misuse accusations of Russian interference? Um, uh... So there are conspiracy theories in the U.S. about Russian interference. The vast majority of those focus on downplaying Russian interference, um, focus on uh, arguing that uh, Russia did not try to interfere in the election um, and that it was non-substantial and that it's a hoax and that um, uh, we're sort of making that all up. I have not seen any conspiracy theories particularly on the left, that would argue that Russia is doing too much or doing the wrong kind. So at least not in my, uh, in my line of work. So I do agree that, that those, the conspiracy theories that are out there are problematic, but they're not trying, but the vast majority of those are trying to downplay Russian interference. And, and I would say that, they, that those have had some success in maybe limiting government uh, intervention in this regard. So they, they, they are problematic. Um, Balkan Yakub, anything you'd like to add, or I go to the next question. So uh, again, I will combine two questions. It's also about uh, uh, propaganda disinformation campaigns uh, coming from China, basically. So the the question is that so we talk about them and how effective they are, but maybe it is not the case actually, because if we can talk about them, maybe they are not so successful because they've been so visible. So, uh, and not subtle, especially in Europe. Uh, I think until the, the COVID crisis, uh, we have been seeing Russia as a threat, but uh, China was not really seen as a threat for, for Europe. Do you think uh, it really backfired what they've been doing during COVID-19 and this disinformation campaign, this propaganda efforts, they were not really at high standards that it didn't really work? I would argue the, the, the Chinese interference campaign actually work quite, quite well in Europe. Um, the evidence for that is that uh, just look over how is Europe responding to various Russian hostile activities. It might be the one in Hong Kong, it might be directly Chinese espionage against European countries in general. It might be the Chinese government's pressure against European countries to push them on, on 5G and Huawei. Um, 
and um, essentially what China is very uh, is successful in Europe in is in creating the the image that you cannot do, or you cannot and you shouldn't do anything against the Chinese interference otherwise you will be crushed they will destroy you economically and um, this is something what basically sabotages and paralyzes um, much of the European response to Chinese interference um, while there is direct evidence that there is so much we could and should be doing. Just look into Australia, which is quite dependent economically on China, but still they are in one of the toughest in their uh, policy responses to Chinese interference. Uh, same way we ha I, have, I have heard many of uh, mainly Western European policymakers saying we shouldn't be doing anything against Russian, Russian interference because they will crush us economically. And then I say, just look in, into Lithuania. They are almost completely de dependent economically on Russia, but still they have very tough national policies against Russian interference. And they are very good at fighting it off. And they are a country of 3 million people, a really small one. Uh, so I think there, are good, there is uh, good evidence uh, that at least China is good in paralyzing European responses to its own hostilities. Um, and um, there China is winning. Uh, we'll see how it backfires. I really think that the, the pandemic um, situation in general, first it shows the dependence of Europe on China in PPE, for example, in the health, in the healthcare sector. Uh, clearly that, that's an issue for me at least. Uh, then uh, I think it clearly shows that, uh, um, I mean, China is seen positively by governments in several countries in Europe in Serbia, in Italy, maybe in some couple of other countries, but in many places where the Chinese government, uh, essentially Chinese diplomats came over to, to their politicians saying, you, if you really want us to help you, you need to get out publicly and say, we are great in doing this. So essentially blackmailing people, you do this or we do this. Um, that's something what even Europeans don't like they, when they are told what to do by basically a communist power. Um, so I think it's, it's, it, it is cracking. Essentially, the Chinese image is cracking in Europe. Um, and if you look across, for example, Eurobarometer polls, so pub, uh, public popular opinion uh, across Europe, you see that China is seen quite negatively among most of European societies, uh, which tells us the final thing, China is very good in elite culture. So essentially, China, uh, the Chinese government is very bad in let's say, uh, getting popular with European societies. They are uh, very bad in doing so, but they are quite good in, uh, in buying political influence in our political establishments, uh, which honestly says this is not sustainable because if your population doesn't like it long term, the politicians cannot really lie so much about it. It, they, it, will, it will backfire, it will come back to them, to some of them who are, who are bad in doing it. Not all of them are. So that's what I think, that's why I'm quite positive about the future on this. Um, Todd, would you like to add an American perspective? Do you think uh, the image of China has changed during the COVID-19 crisis in the U U.S.? I don't know. It's hard to tell. Uh, I've not seen data one way or another on that. Um, uh, and I, I don't, I'm not, it's hard to tell whether or not their campaign has been effective here. I, I will note that it's interesting that, you know, looking, looking back to what China did in Hong Kong, um, they ran a very adolescent uh, social media campaign, if you will, by, uh, you know, uh, purchasing a lot of old porn related uh, Twitter accounts and repurposing them to make uh, sort of political hacks against the, uh, against the protesters. Um, they have definitely stepped up their game here, uh, um, but it's hard for me to tell whether or not they've been effective um, in changing the dialogue uh, in the U.S. Balkan, any final comments? Uh, one quick, just to accentuate what Jakob said, um, and I think it was an excellent analysis of, of the future uh, for the Chinese uh, influence in Europe. One thing is, is to make this clear that they're not so much interested, the, the, the Chinese Communist Party is not so much interested in sort of winning hearts and minds uh, in Europe, and that's obviously uh, not happening uh, on the public, uh, public level. So they focus on the elite capture and, and their um, sort of uh, the tools are quite blunt there. Uh, it's mostly intimidation and bullying and, 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 and um, you know, if it doesn't work, it's just, you know, buying off uh, with the promises uh, uh, of this and that and investment and so on and so forth. But it is not really sort of sustainable in the long term because the politicians are 
I mean, uh, it would depend on, they, they want to get elected, then they want to get reelected. And when the public uh, is, is not quite happy with uh, how China is trying to sort of force its own narrative uh, on, on, on Europe and European populations, and it's quite clear that they don't care to sort of convince, but try to sort of bludgeon to uh, submission, uh, you know, the whole sort of Red Guards approach, uh, cultural uh, revolution approach to convincing people, um, that would backfire. And, and the politicians would pivot very quickly once they sort of figure out that the cost of, of, of kowtowing to the Chinese Communist uh, Party uh, outweighs the benefits uh, that they might get from that. Um, so I'm not just sort of very optimistic in terms of uh, convincing the, the Chinese uh, attempts to convince um, uh, the Europeans that they are a very, they are going to be a benevolent uh, superpower. I'm not, you know, I, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, but we, we should be much more concerned about the, uh, the elite capture and how uh, they, they could use uh, corruption and other means to, 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 to convince uh, the, the certain segments of the elite to do their bidding. Well, thank you very much, Todd, Balkan, Jakob. Thank you very much for joining us today. I also would like to thank all our participants for their questions. Our next webinar under the program, this information program, will be next Wednesday, 3rd of June. Uh, we'll be organizing it in cooperation with the International Press Institute, and it will be on quality journalism as a remedy against disinformation. We will have speakers from International Press Institute, Wall Street Journal, and Penn Moscow. We hope to see you there too. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us.